Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about ethics and uh, the human acts. Ethics, we say, directs human acts. However, not all the acts of man are called human acts, but only such as are under the control of his free will. Moreover, when we talk about ethics, it is also a science of morality, judges human conduct, which is basically made up of human actions. We know that humans are said to be evaluative in nature. So ethics is said to be a philosophical treatise which studies human behavior and tries to determine whether the act performed was morally right or wrong. Now we say that when we talk about the human act, whatever he does necessarily, that is whatever he cannot help doing, results from the physical laws of nature, and as such is willed and directed by the author of nature. For instance, a man may fall like a stone, or grow like a plant, or perceive a sound like a brute animal without any power on his part to prevent himself from falling or growing or hearing if the required conditions are present. So these are called acts of man. They are not acts of what is distinctively human, namely his intellect and will. So these acts of humans then are involuntary and therefore not morally responsible for them. The term human act is restricted in those acts which a man does knowingly and willingly which he has the power either to do or not to do. So this human act is one which proceeds from knowledge and from the consent of free will. Or in other words, it is an act which emanates from the will with a knowledge of the end or goal to which the act leads. Now we'll be talking about the constituent elements of the human act. And when we talk about the constituent elements of human act, they refer to the eternal or inner causes or the constituting elements which generate a human person to undertake a certain act. So the understanding of the human act indicates that there are two essential elements which constitute a human act. That is the intellectual element and the volitive element. So the intellectual element or what we call the intellect, we will understand this concept when we know that each one of us has the power to know. So we talk about knowledge, which is one of the most important qualities which distinguish humans from other sentient beings. So we have this act of knowing as undertaken by the faculty of the intellect. And this process of knowing entail certain important conditions. Number one, we have that adequate knowledge of the aspired object. Number two, we have this attention to the action by which the particular object is to be pursued. And the last, we have this judgment on the value of the act. The next is the volitive dimension, which is the will, which points that the will can freely make a choice of the concrete object in which the good is sought. Thus, when we hold a person morally responsible for his or her action, we assume that the act was done freely, knowing 
and willingly. The idea of responsibility would seem then to connote and presuppose that of free will. So when free will and intellect interact, we will see the so-called voluntariness in the action. Very often a voluntary act performed by an agent knowingly and freely in order to realize some foreseen end and is not a spontaneous reaction. It really involves a dynamic process and that the person also has awareness of the means that are required to attain the proper object. So the direction of the human acts in general. We already know that when we do an act, it really has a purpose. That is why the end to which human acts are to be directed and this means end is the purpose for which a thing exists. It is also the end of an act, the purpose for which that act is done. We have to understand that every human act is done for an end. For a human act is an act of the will and the will cannot act unless the intellect proposes to it something to which it may tend that is something that which is good the will is only another name for the rational appetite that is the power of tending to a good which the intellect proposes to it so the good intended is the end of the act you may object that you have no special intention for example, in reading, that you merely read to kill time, to be busy with something, etc. Nevertheless, you act for an end or purpose. The end in this case is simply being to kill the time or simply to find occupation. So we do not say that the end intended is always a true good but only that it is always good after a manner that is at least an apparent good and aimed at because it is apprehended as good. It may be conceived as good in itself, worth tending to for its own sake, or as a means conducive to some other good. No man, however, intends evil for the sake of evil but only because he sees something good and desirable in what he wills or in its result. So a man may do evil to another for the sake of revenge and thus to do what is morally bad. He may do evil to himself. He may even kill himself. Yet he cannot do so except for a purpose which he apprehends as good in some respect, for example, to be freed from troubles and worries. No will can possibly act without aiming at something that has been apprehended as in some way desirable. So we must distinguish the nearest or proximate end and the farther or remote end and the last or the ultimate end beyond which the agent does not look and in which his desire rests. Thus, for example, a student may exert himself in order to win a prize because by gaining the prize, he will please his parents and by striving to please his parents, he will please God. So in this act of the student, the prize is the nearest end, his parents, a farther end, and God the last end. Perhaps he does not think of God, 
but aims at placing his parents so as to receive a promised sum of money with which finally he intends to buy some sweetmeats for the gratification of his palate. In this act, he makes the enjoyment he derives from the gratification of his palate as the last end. An end is also said to be actually intended if at the time of the act it is thought of and aimed at. It is virtually intended if the act is influenced by a former intention to attain an end, though that end is not thought of at the time of the act. It is habitually intended if a former intention has not been retracted, yet does not for the time being affect the act. Interpretatively intended, if the act was not really intended, but would have been so intended if the case in hand had been foreseen. So let us take an example on this. For example, a boy is sent by his father to assist a distressed family. He sets out with the actual intention of fulfilling his this commission. While walking along, he is occupied with other thoughts and is unmindful of his message. Yet, he directs his steps aright in virtue of his former intention, that is, with virtual intention. He may delay for hours at a friend's house totally uninfluenced by the purpose for which he started out. Nevertheless, as that purpose has not been given up, it remains as a habit. It is habitual. At last, he reaches the distressed family and finds them in such want that he feels confident that his father, if he knew the circumstances, would wish him to give a larger sums of money than the sum appointed. Accordingly, he gives this larger arms, acting on his father's intention as he interprets it. This is the father's interpretative intention, that is, what he would have actually intended if he had known the facts. I hope you have learned something from this lesson. You know what is ethics, you know what is a human act, and what constitutes a human act.